Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Y using only spooky season Pokemon. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace, and we're playing on set mode. It's that time of year again. The air is cooling, the leaves are changing colors, and as the month of October comes to an end, it's time for the yearly celebration of Halloween. A night that has come to represent all things monstrous, spooky, and scary. Whether it's dressing up and partying with your friends, watching scary movies with your family, or passing out at 8pm in a candy corn coma, we all have our traditions for this beautiful holiday. And this year I thought I'd start a new tradition, by sharing a scary story with you. So gather round, sit back, and listen closely, as I tell you the story of the spookiest Nuzlocke of the season. It's a tale filled with action and adventure, friendship and betrayal, life and death, tricks and treats. Oh, and if you scare easily, it's best to keep the lights on. Just as a quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Let's see how this goes. Our twisted tale begins with one of life's scariest acts. Small talk at a cafe with the group of people you just met. And there's not even any food. The scariest part about this social situation that I'm in is that I am completely trapped. I came with Serena and Shauna, so it's not like I can just leave whenever I want. That would be rude. And it's not like I even have anywhere else to go. I just moved here. They know I don't have any friends. Kathy Bates might as well have me tied to a bed because I'm not going anywhere until Serena and Shauna decide that it's time to leave. Fortunately, my own personal hell is made a little bit better when I get to choose my starter. Only one of the three choices fits the spooky season theme though, and that's Fennekin, who will evolve into the mystical witch-like Pokemon Breaksin and Delphox. I name him Pyrophobia, and with that, our monster squad has its first team member. After that, my new friend group scatters into the winds, and I head off in search of adventure, naive to the horrors that await me. According to my fairly arbitrary list of what counts as Halloween-related Pokemon, there aren't any other encounters before the first gym, so it's just Pyrophobia versus Viola's creepy crawly bug types. Now you'd think that this would be a walk in the park. Stroll in, burn some bugs, collect a gym badge. But Viola has a Surskit, which is a bug water type, and therefore takes neutral damage from our fire type moves. It also knows Bubble to hit us for super effective damage. So it's not as easy as you might think. And by not as easy as you might think, I mean that it is borderline impossible to beat the bug type gym with the fire type starter using a hardcore rule set. Even if I use super training to give Pyrophobia max EVs, at such a low level, it wouldn't make much of a difference. I might be able to take out the Surskit, but even then, the Vivillon would be able to tank a few embers and finish us off. Fennekin is actually a very bad Pokemon. So is our story over? Cut short before we even really started? I look back at the list of potential encounters before the first gym, and I decide that there is one encounter that could be loosely associated with Halloween. And that's a Weedle from Santaloon Forest. Maggots, worms, and bugs are generally pretty creepy, and Weedle will evolve into Beedrill. Bees are definitely scary especially ones that are three feet tall and have stabby stabbers for hands. Plus, bees have been featured in a few classic horror movies. So, welcome to the squad, Apophobia. After Apophobia becomes a Beedrill, it's time to square off against Viola again. This time, though, I'm prepared. Or should I say, I'm B-paired. Wait, why do you guys watch my stuff? Viola leads Surskit and I lead Apophobia. Surskit starts with a quick attack, and then Apophobia goes for a fury attack, which manages to hit five times, including a critical hit, which is just enough damage to one-shot the Surskit. That basically could not have gone more perfectly. Fortunately, good luck at the very beginning of a run always means that the rest of the run will also be smooth sailing. Vivillon comes out and goes for a tackle as I lower its speed with a string shot. After defeating the Surskit, Apophobia leveled up to level 13, which is okay according to my rule set, since the level cap ends at the start of the gym battle. This means that Apophobia learns Focus Energy, so I use it to increase my critical hit chance as Vivillon goes for a Harden. Then I proceed to use Fury Attack, which crits three times in a row, and then Vivillon uses Harden again. After a few more turns of attacking furiously, which is miraculously not missing, Vivillon falls into the red. This means Viola is going to heal, and I don't really want to have to deal with hitting a bunch of Fury Attacks again, so I just switch to Pyrophobia, who's female in this attempt, and then Viola heals with a Potion. 
Then it's just a matter of using two embers to take down Vivalon, netting us our first gym badge. There's a big stretch of the game between the first two gym badges, so our monster squad really starts to fill out. From Route 6, I catch a haunted sword, and I name her Eichmophobia. Also, Pyrophobia evolves into a Digimon, but I can't find that footage. On Route 7, I catch the deadly toad Pokemon Krogunk, and I name her Renitophobia. In Connecting Cave, I catch a Zubat, and I name him Hemophobia. Then, on Route 8, I catch a Drifloon, and I name him Globophobia. But Globophobia isn't on the team for too long because he's quickly replaced by a Cubone that I catch in Glittering Cave. I name him Monophobia. And now we've got a nice, relatively diverse team of six. Our monster squad is complete. By the end of the journey, we'll likely swap teams in and out for various challenges, but these original six, the sinister six, if you will, will always have a special place in my heart. Friends, till the end. Hemophobia evolves into Golbat, and then it's time for the Sinister Six to face their first gym challenge as a complete team. Grant and his rock types. He leads Amara, and I lead Renitophobia. She does big damage to Amara with a rock smash, but it hangs on and hits a rock tomb, which lowers my speed. Grant goes for a hyper potion, but then revenge cleanly knocks out the Amara. Tyrant is second and last for Grant. It uses Stomp for pretty decent damage, but since it doesn't get a flinch, revenge hits it back for a huge chunk of damage. On the next turn, I switch to Eichmophobia, who is immune to Stomp, and then we finish off the Tyrant with a priority Shadow Sneak, getting us an easy second gym badge. Good teamwork, girls. After that last battle, I'm feeling pretty good about the Monster Squad, and it's just gonna get bigger and better. First, Hemophobia evolves into Crobat. Then, from Route 10, I catch a Golette named Megalophobia. From Route 11, I find a horde of Stunky, and after brutally murdering all of her friends, I catch one of them, name her Osmophobia, and then dump her in the box. Monophobia also evolves into Marowak. Then in Reflection Cave, I try to catch a Sableye, but the thing uses Fury Swipes into Monophobia while he's holding a rocky helmet. So that's the end of that. My bad. After that, it's time to face Karina. And here's the thing about Karina. Her Mianfu has no way of hitting Eichmophobia. And for some reason, she just doesn't switch. She just sits there with her finger in her nose as I set up two sword stances. Then I kill her with a Shadow Claw. Macho comes out and uses Leer, but then I kill it with a single Shadow Claw. Halucha is last, but after it just goes for a Hone Claws, another Shadow Claw knocks it out. Easy stuff, that's badge number three. There's no new spooky encounters between gyms, so the only thing stopping us from fighting Ramos and his grass types is a pesky fight with our rival Serena. She leads Meowstic and I lead Pyrophobia. Meowstic uses Light Screen and then I use Flame Charge for very pitiful damage but it does give me a speed boost, so I'm able to outspeed for another sliver of damage on the next turn, but then Meowstic hits a surprisingly hard Psybeam. So I switch to Eichmophobia as Meowstic goes for Disarming Voice for some reason. I hit a priority Shadow Sneak, but Meowstic hangs on and gets off another Psybeam, and then a second Shadow Sneak knocks it out on the next turn. Second for Serena is Absol, and it's starting to dawn on me that my team kind of struggles against Dark types. I don't have a lot of ways to hit them for super effective damage other than with Apophobia and Renitophobia, who are both pretty defensively frail. I switch to Monophobia, who gets hit hard by a bite. Then Absol goes for another bite, which crits, and then Monophobia misses his Bone Meringue. It's great to have a 100 base power stab move this early in the game, but the 90% accuracy is a bit frustrating. Well obviously I gotta switch here, so I switch to Renitophobia and take way too much damage from a quick attack. Since this thing also knows Slash, I switch to Hemophobia, but Absol just goes for another quick attack, which crits. So I go for an Acrobatics, but it's pretty weak since I'm still holding an Orenberry, so Absol survives and hits a Slash, which also crits. This does activate our Orenberry though, so I'm free to fire off a full-powered Acrobatics, knocking out Absol. Last is Frogadier and I assume that a fully powered 110 base power acrobatics will be enough to knock out this derpy frog. But you know what they say about assuming, right? Frogadier hangs on in the red, letting it fire off a torrent boosted water pulse that kills Hemophobia. Serena, my supposed friend, has just claimed the first death of the run. I guess it makes sense. Up until this point, the run had been going far too smoothly. The badges were too easy, the battles were too simple. Death is inevitable. It comes for all of us, and it appears that it came faster than I expected for poor Hemophobia. The only question is, was Hemophobia's death just a freak accident, or was it a warning sign of even more death to come? Although one of the Sinister Six may have passed, 
the remaining five must soldier on. Globophobia is brought in to replace Hemophobia, and with a bit of training, he evolves into Driftblim. Just stay away from Apophobia. And Eichmophobia. Those are accidents waiting to happen. Now it's time to face Ramos. He leads Jumpluff, and I lead Eichmophobia. Jumpluff sets up a leech seed, and then Eichmophobia goes for an aerial ace. Then Jumpluff does just a sliver of damage with acrobatics as Eichmophobia lands another aerial ace, which puts Jumpluff in the red. I'm hoping that the leech seed damage takes Jumpluff out of healing range, but it doesn't. So Ramos uses a hyper potion as we hit yet another aerial ace. I don't have the HP to deal with Jumpluff healing again, so I go for a swords dance as Jumpluff continues to do damage with acrobatics and leech seed. Then, after tanking one more acrobatics, an aerial ace knocks out Jumpluff. Gogo comes out second for Ramos, so I switch to the newest member of the team, Globophobia, who's immune to bulldoze. Gogo can only damage Globophobia with Grass Knot, which does very little damage, so it's pretty safe to just chip away with Gust. Globophobia is not the fastest killer in the world, especially because Ramos uses another Hyper Potion here, but eventually Globophobia gets the job done, and Gogo goes down. Last is Weepin Bell, but it appears that Globophobia has just had enough with this whole song and dance, and decides to take it out with a single critical hit gust. That wins us the fourth gym badge. Soon after this, Eichmophobia evolves into Dubblade. And from here, it's usually a pretty quick turnaround to get to the sixth gym in Lumio City. The only thing you need to do is cross through Route 13, which might be one of the most infuriating routes in any Pokemon game. Route 13 is very large and populated by Pokemon that move in overworld dust clouds that will try to hunt you down and engage in battle. This means that even when using repels, it's pretty much impossible to fully avoid these little guys, which are usually either Dug Trio or Trap Hinch, both of which can have the ability Arena Trap that prevents switching. This isn't a huge deal if you make sure to always lead with a fairly fast flying type, since flying types are immune to Arena Trap, but I'm not perfect. Sometimes I forget that I should be leading with a flying type. Sometimes I don't remember to instantly switch back to Globophobia after fighting a Team Flare Grunt as I try to go back to the Pokemon Center to heal. So sometimes I accidentally lead, I don't know, a poison type that's at half health. And so just like that, I have to helplessly watch a random wild trap hinge murder Renitophobia. Deaths to random wild Pokemon are possibly the cruelest and most heartbreaking deaths in a Nuzlocke. For they act as a stark reminder that in reality, death can feel so random, and come when you least expect it. You let your guard down for 5 seconds, and death takes its advantage. Rest in peace, Renitophobia. Our sweet toxic toad is replaced by Osmophobia the toxic skunk. I guess Stunky isn't exactly directly related to Halloween, but I don't know, skunks are pretty creepy and spooky, so it made sense to me at the time. Plus, I've never gotten to use this Pokemon. Anyways, with some training, Osmophobia evolves into Skunk Tank. Then we head to Lumio City, where we encounter the most perplexing NPC in the history of Pokemon. Who is this ghost girl? What does she want? Why is she in the game? I guess we'll never know. With a bit of training, Pyrophobia evolves into Delphox, which might be one of my least favorite final starters, but at least it's a really good Pokemon. Fire Psychic gives us great coverage, and Pyrophobia is pretty strong and pretty fast, so this is a great addition to the team. Now it's time for the gym battle against Clement and his electric types. He leads Amolja, and I lead Osmophobia. Amolja outspeeds and hits us with a Volt Switch, bringing in Magneton, which is perfect because we just nail it with a Flamethrower on the Switch. Then Osmophobia outspeeds and knocks out the Magneton with one more Flamethrower. Next is Heliolisk. Somewhere I got the idea that Pokemon with the ability Dry Skin take more damage from fire type attacks, so I stay in and go for a Flamethrower. Heliolisk outspeeds us and hits an incredibly strong Thunderbolt that would have just killed if it crit. I guess I just underestimated its damage output. Also, Flamethrower does like no damage. So I switch to Monophobia, who is immune to Thunderbolt. Heliolisk does no Grass Knot though, so I can't stay in. I just switch to Globophobia, who will take very little damage from Grass Knot. Or no damage from the quick attack that Heliolisk is using for some reason. Then I switch back to Monophobia, and I can do this approximately 15 more times to stall Heliolisk out of its Thunderbolt PP. It's not lost on me that I could just stay in with Monophobia and kill it with a Bone Meringue, since Heliolisk is just going for a quick attack, but who knows if Clement will just randomly decide to mix it up and use Grass Knot. I don't know. This is more tedious, but it's also completely safe, so there's no point in risking it. Once the Heliolisk is out of Thunderbolts, I switch to Pyrophobia, who takes pitiful damage from Grass Knot. Then, a Mystical Fire and a couple of Psy Shocks are enough to finish off the Little Lizard. Last is a Molja, but he's not threatening Pyrophobia either. 
two Psy Shocks are enough to take it out as we just take some damage from a Volt Switch. And with that, we've got the fifth Gym Badge. Next up is another fight with Serena. Since our last fight, we've had a slight roster shift and now three of our Pokemon are weak to dark moves. Serena's Frogadier has also evolved into Greninja, so now she has two dark types. Fortunately, Osmophobia helps us out quite a bit here. After Meowstic uses Fake Out for basically no damage, she sets up a light screen and Osmophobia hits her with a strong Shadow Claw. Even with a critical hit though, this Meowstic is surprisingly bulky, so it lives to hit a disarming voice on the next turn, but then Osmophobia knocks it out with a Night Slash, and Black Sludge Recovery keeps our stinky girl relatively healthy. Absol a second, so I just go for Toxic as Absol goes for a Slash. Which crits. Annoying, but whatever. On the next turn, Absol hits a soft quick attack for some reason, and I hit an Acid Spray to lower Absol's special defense. On the next turn, I hit the Absol with a Flamethrower as it just goes for a Sword Stance. But thanks to Toxic damage and Serena's Light Screen wearing off, one more Flamethrower knocks out Absol on the next turn. Last is Serena's Murderous Greninja. It uses a Priority Water Shuriken that hits three times, and then I get off a Toxic. On the next turn, Greninja just goes for Quick Attack, so I'm able to get off an Acid Spray. Then, Greninja just goes for another Quick Attack for some reason, so I just hit it with another Acid Spray. But now with Toxic damage accumulating, Greninja is in Torrent, so not wanting another tragedy on my hand, I switch to the Full Health Apophobia. But then Greninja just goes for a Quick Attack again. So we shake it off, and Apophobia gets to watch his friend's murderer succumb to the painful death by poison. How is this the trainer that I lost a Crobat to? She's so bad at battling sometimes. After this, I find this very sad swing set, and then I just take a long sit in the pouring rain. This apparently abandoned playground on the edge of this very creepy forest is the perfect place to reflect on the passage of time and lost childhood innocence. Remember how fun it used to be to go to a playground? It was a simpler time. It was a time when playing Pokemon games was just pure joyous wish fulfillment, instead of a death-riddled hellscape where any wrong play results in the brutal murder of one of my friends. But I guess that's just part of growing up, right? Realizing that life is nothing more than a high-stakes Nuzlocke? Maybe this is too depressing, even for a spooky Nuzlocke. I'll move on. From here, I get another encounter, a Haunter on Route 14. I name him Phasmophobia, and he goes into the box. Then I meet up with all of my friends that haven't killed somebody, and we enter this spooky house that, as far as I can tell, really has no purpose for being in the game. An old man tells us a scary story about a horde of faceless men or something, and then he demands a tip. He even goes as far as threatening us if we don't tip him. We just came for a spooky story, and that's it. Not to have some sad, sad, pathetic man ask us for free handouts. Have some self-respect, buddy. Oh hey, by the way guys, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel. If you don't, you might see something really scary. Next up is the fairy type gym leader, Valerie. But here's the thing about Valerie. She sucks. She leads Mawile and I lead Osmophobia. A flamethrower leaves Mawile with a sliver and then it hits a weak crunch. On the next turn, Valerie heals, so flamethrower leaves it with a sliver again. Then Valerie uses her second Hyper Potion, and we appear to low roll a third Flamethrower so that Mawile is now just in the yellow. But it doesn't matter, another Flamethrower kills it on the following turn. Second is Mr. Mime, but we outspeed it and kill it with a single Poison Jab. Sylveon is last, and actually does hold on to a Poison Jab, but we also get the Poison. But Sylveon's Cute Charm does activate as well, so Osmophobia is blinded by love as she gets hit by a pretty hard Dazzling Gleam. Fortunately, Valerie wasted her Hyper Potions on her Mawile that was getting burned alive, so all that's left for me to do is switch to Pyrophobia, who gets hit by a charm, I guess, and then Poison Damage finishes off Sylveon. And that's badge number 6. From here, we get two new spooky encounters. First, from Route 15, I catch a Skiruppi, and I name her Entomophobia. She has the ability Sniper, though, instead of Battle Armor, so into the box she goes. Then, from Route 16, I catch a plump little Pumpkaboo. It'd be cool to use this guy, since he's literally a ghost pumpkin, making him the perfect Halloween-themed Pokémon, but unfortunately I need to trade to evolve him, so he's just going into the box, which is actually starting to get pretty crowded. Oh, and I name him Botanophobia. Before the next gym badge, it's time for yet another battle with rival Serena. In my last Kalos run, I almost wiped this battle, so I knew not to take it lightly. She leads Meowstic, and I lead Osmophobia. Immediately, she does some chip damage with Fake Out as I flinch, but I get most of it back with Black Sludge Recovery. Then Meowstic uses a Disarming Voice as I retaliate with a Night Slash, which somehow still doesn't kill this cat. I guess Osmophobia just doesn't hit that hard. 
On the next turn, we take just another small tick of damage from a disarming voice, and a second Night Slash finishes off Meowstic. Serena's new Pokemon Flareon is out second. I decide to stay in and hit it with a Night Slash, which does just over half its health. Then Flareon retaliates with a critical hit Lava Plume that almost kills Osmophobia. Well, that really sucks. I switch to Pyrophobia, who shakes off a quick attack, and then we kill the Flareon with a Psy Shock. Third is Greninja, which hits our entire team for super effective damage other than Osmophobia, who's almost out of health, and Apophobia. So I switch to Apophobia. Greninja gets a three-hit Water Shuriken. Then on the next turn, he goes for another Water Shuriken, which hits three times again. And then Apophobia hits a Twin Needle, which thanks to a crit, puts Greninja into Torrent range. So now things are looking kinda bad. I decide that maybe Eichmophobia with Eviolite can tank a Water Shuriken and a follow-up Dark Pulse, so I switch her in. But for some reason, Serena just goes for Dark Pulse instead of Water Shuriken, which almost one-shots Eichmophobia. So I guess that was always going to be a pretty bad plan. Now I'm in trouble though. Monophobia does have enough defense to tank a Water Shuriken, but definitely not enough to tank two, and everyone else will go down to two hits of Water Shuriken or Dark Pulse as well. So unfortunately, I need a sack. And this horrible burden falls on Apophobia, who switches in on a Water Shuriken and goes down. After that, I bring in Monophobia, who thankfully survives a four-hit Water Shuriken and takes out the Greninja with a Bulldoze. Last for Serena is Absol. I decide that I have to stay in with Monophobia and risk a crit. Thankfully, Absol doesn't get the crit with Night Slash, so I'm able to hit a Bulldoze. I'm anticipating a quick attack, so I switch to Globophobia, but of course Absol goes for Night Slash again instead. Thankfully, we dodge another crit though. So on the next turn, Globophobia is able to outspeed and just barely knock out Absol with a not very effective Shadow Ball. With that, the battle is won, but it hardly feels like a victory. For the second time this challenge, my fight with Serena ends with a member of the Sinister Six slain. Eichmophobia was the best of us. He wasn't much for hugs, sure, but he was deeply loved by everyone on the team. The space his absence leaves is suffocating. Acmophobia came into this world as a wee little weedle, and he left it as a warrior. He will be truly missed. Rest in bees, Acmophobia. Rest in bees. To fill the giant bee-shaped hole in our hearts, I turn to none other than Botanophobia. Fortunately, a kind stranger agrees to do a quick trade with me so that Botanophobia can evolve into Gorgeist. I also trade Phasmophobia so he evolves into Gengar, but he stays in the box. At least until Serena decides to murder another one of my friends, I guess. But for now, it's time for the psychic type gym leader, Olympia. But other than an insanely tedious gym puzzle, she's a piece of cake. She leads Sigalyph, and I lead Eichmophobia. Sigalyph starts with a Reflect, so our Shadow Claw doesn't do as much damage as I would have hoped. On the next turn, she goes for a Psychic, as a second Shadow Claw leaves Sigalyph with just a sliver of health. Olympia uses a Hyper Potion, as I go for a third Shadow Claw. Then I go for a Priority Shadow Sneak, so that she doesn't use another Hyper Potion, and Sigalyph hits another Psychic. Then, after tanking one more Psychic, Eichmophobia knocks out the Sigalyph with the third Shadow Claw. Second is Meowstic, who knows Shadow Ball. So I switch to Osmophobia, who shakes it off like it's nothing, and gains some HP back with Black Sludge. Meowstic goes for a Calm Mind on the next turn, and then we hit it with a Night Slash that leaves it with a Sliver. So Olympia uses a Hyper Potion, and then Night Slash brings it back down to red health. Thanks for the recovery from Black Sludge, I guess. After another Shadow Ball, a Night Slash kills Meowstic. And then last is Slowking. So we hit it with a Night Slash, which as I've come to expect, leaves it with a Sliver. But Slowking just uses Calm Mind. So one final Night Slash knocks it out and wins us the seventh gym badge. After this, Lysander sends a message to everyone in Kalos, casually informing us that he's decided to more or less end the world. This is kind of like getting a Facebook message from Mark Zuckerberg being like, hi everyone, just wanting to let you know that we're gonna kill everyone on the planet now. But let's be real, when Facebook does inevitably wipe out life on this planet, there is zero chance that they'll have the decency to give us a heads up. So good on you, Lysander. You could have been worse, I guess. Anyways, I should probably go stop this whole thing from happening. It involves fighting Lysander three separate times in the span of about 15 minutes, so we'll skip the first two fights. I do find out that Lysander is keeping a man in a cage with an electric fence, but that's above my pay grade. He'll be fine. Probably. I have other things to worry about anyways like this massive pulsating monolith that Lysander thrusts out of the ground. Then I gotta face off against Evil Tall, but since you actually have to catch it for the story to continue, I just lob my Master Ball at it. Sure, you could argue that this giant chicken of death is pretty spooky, but I decide to just dump it in the box. 
After that, it's time for the final Lysander fight. So for the sake of finality, let's see how it goes. He leads Mian Xiao and I lead Pyrophobia. I set up a Calm Mind as Mian Xiao goes for a Sword Stance. So then on the next turn, I just kill it with Psychic. Pyroar is second, so I take this moment to set up another Calm Mind and Pyroar hits a Dark Pulse, but with the Calm Mind boosts, it's not doing much damage. A Psychic takes it out on the next turn. Third is Honchcrow, so we roast that bird alive with a Flamethrower. Last is Gyarados. But thanks to Lysander Mega evolving it, we're able to hit the Fat Shrimp with a very hard, super effective Grass Knot, winning us an incredibly easy victory. Seriously, of the three Lysander fights, this one was probably the easiest. Anyways, as quickly as it was erected, Lysander's throbbing monolith retracts back into the ground, leaving a gaping hole that I'm sure somebody will find useful. With the world saved, we can continue on with our gym campaign. On the way to Snowbell City, I find an Ariados in Terminus Cave. I catch him and name him Nyctophobia. Also in Terminus Cave, I finally get a Dusk Stone, which I use to finally evolve Eichmophobia into Aegislash. Yeah, I know I could have gotten a Dusk Stone earlier from Super Training, but I didn't want to do that. From here, we have to face off against all three of the rivals that aren't Serena. I remember this actually being pretty tough though, since they come at you back to back to back, so you don't actually get to heal, and a few of their Pokemon are quite powerful. First is Shauna, who leads with Delcaddy. I lead the newly evolved Eichmophobia. I start with a King Shield, which instantly backfires as Delcaddy hits a charm. So on the next turn, I get hit by a Feint attack, which does very little damage, and then I hit her with an Iron Head. Then I use King Shield, which switches me back into shield form and lowers Delcaddy's attack as she goes for another Feint attack. Then I tank a Feint attack, switch back into blade form, and hit another Iron Head. Then I decide to switch to Pyrophobia, who unfortunately does get hit by a critical hit Feint attack. Then a Psychic finishes Delcaddy off. Next is Gudra, who knows Earthquake, so this is actually pretty scary. I switch to Botanophobia, who resists Earthquake. Then I go for Leech Seed, completely forgetting that Gudra has the ability Sap Sipper, so I just gave it a free attack boost. Then Gudra retaliates with a Dragon Pulse, which does way more damage than I was expecting. This is bad. I switch to Globophobia on another Dragon Pulse, which does another huge chunk of damage. And now I gotta risk a crit to start actually doing some damage. I hit Gudra for just the tiniest chunk of damage with Shadow Ball, and then fall into the red from another Dragon Pulse. I decide to switch to Eichmophobia, who tanks a Dragon Pulse pretty well. Then I use King Shield to confirm that Gudra is going for Earthquake. Then I switch to Monophobia, but thanks to my idiocy using Leech Seed, Earthquake still does a lot of damage. I stay in and barely tank a Dragon Pulse, which lets us retaliate with a Bone Meringue that just barely doesn't knock out Gudra. From here, I switch in Eichmophobia, who tanks another Dragon Pulse. And then on the next turn, I'm able to finish off the Gudra with a Priority Shadow Sneak. That Gudra really messed us up. Last for Shauna is Chestnut. She starts by using Spiky Shield, as I use King's Shield. Then I switch to Botanophobia, who tanks a Seed Bomb. I go for a Phantom Force, which does a little bit of damage, and then we get hit by another Seed Bomb. Then I switch to Pyrophobia, who tanks a Seed Bomb fairly well. Chestnut then goes for a Spiky Shield, but that just stalls the inevitable for a turn. Because on the next turn, I hit it with a Flamethrower, knocking it out and winning us the battle. But there's no time to breathe, because Tierno is up next, and he didn't let me heal. Since Shauna's Gudra tore through my team, and we still have to fight Trevor with a freaking Aerodactyl after this, this is starting to look a bit scary. Tierno leads Talonflame, and I lead Eichmophobia. I decide that my best bet is to conserve the health on Osmophobia to get her ready for the fight against Trevor. Fortunately, Tierno's Talonflame doesn't have a Fire-type move, so it's safe to stay in with Eichmophobia and use Sword Stances as Talonflame uses a Sword Stance of her own. On the next turn, we both go for another Sword Stance. This would be scary, but now I have a priority Shadow Sneak, which I can use to one-shot Talonflame. But then Crawdont comes out, which can hit five of my six Pokemon for super effective stab damage. Water Dark is the perfect type combination into my team, and both Serena and Tierno have a Water Dark type. Just as a reminder, I have to keep Osmophobia healthy for the fight against Trevor's Aerodactyl. I also don't want to switch and give Crawdont the chance to set up a Sword Stance for free. So I decide to first use King Shield to switch to shield form and get my defenses up. Crawdont goes for a Night Slash, so his attack harshly falls. Based on a quick calc, plus 4 Iron Head is a roll to kill Crawdont here. Unfortunately, I'm faster than Crawdont, so if I miss the kill, I'll be in blade form with low defenses, and Crawdont will be able to kill me with a Night Slash even at minus 2. But I don't really have another play, so I go for Iron Head. But it's a low roll. So, Eichmophobia gets hit with a Night Slash, and goes down. That really sucks. 
Pyrophobia, one of the last two remaining members of the Sinister Six comes out, and flamethrowers down Crawdon, as well as Tierno's Roserade. I can't believe I lost a Pokemon to this guy. And you know the worst part? Apparently, you get healed after this fight, because look who's alive and kicking at the start of the fight with Trevor. So Eichmophobia died for nothing. Obviously, with a fully healthy team, this fight against Trevor isn't remotely difficult. But man, is that unbelievably frustrating. Here is a great example of how critical game knowledge is for Nuzlocking. I just don't have much experience with these games, so it's easy to forget little things like whether you get healed between rival fights. So as I bury my fourth spooky friend, I can't help but feel like this one is my fault. Farewell, Eichmophobia. For the fourth time this run, I'm tasked with finding a replacement team member. I decide that it's time to bring out the original ghost Pokemon. Phasmophobia the Gengar, with his shit-eating grin, joins the team. He's got big shoes to fill, though. After some training, it's time to take on the last gym leader, Wolfric, and his ice types. But with Pyrophobia, this gym is so easy that it's almost a little offensive. Three flamethrowers, and that's all she wrote. Solving the gym puzzle actually took significantly more time than the gym battle itself. That's eight badges. All that's left now is to enter Victory Road and take on the Elite Form. There are a few difficult trainers in Victory Road, but most of them just have a single Pokemon that can be taken out with a single hit. Like Black Belt Marcus, who only has a Machamp, who can easily be one-shot by a Stab Psychic from Pyrophobia, right? Motherfuck. You know, I was fine when Hemophobia died to a Torrent Water Pulse. I was a little annoyed when Renitophobia got Arena Trapped by a Wild Trap Inch. A bit crushed when I had to sack Apophobia to Greninja. And I was rightfully embarrassed when I lost Eichmophobia to a battle with the third best rival in the game. But in what world does a Machamp not get one shot by a Psychic from Delphox? Losing my starter was the last straw. Time to bring out the big guns. I scour the caves of Victory Road until I find a Noibat. I name her Dracophobia. Then I use Super Training to max out her speed and special attack. Then I evolve her into Noivern. Dracophobia is a monster engineered for one purpose. To kill. To kill anything and everything in her path. She does happen to have a jolly nature and a special attack IV of one, but that's besides the point. She is death. And with her on the team, we're able to safely clear through the rest of Victory Road, including a final fight with Serena. Not today, Serena. So that gets us to the Elite Four. And here's our final team. Monophobia the Marowak is all that remains of the original Sinister Six. His life has been nothing but pain. He was born an orphan, wearing the skull of his dead mother, and then Monophobia had to watch five of his closest friends die, one by one. And now he's tasked with leading this new team to victory. With him is the destroyer of the mid-game, Osmophobia, and the floating fiend, Globophobia. There's also Botanophobia, who hasn't gotten much screen time, but was invaluable for various fights that didn't make it into the video. And rounding out the team are Phasmophobia and Dracophobia, who haven't contributed much yet, but are waiting to unleash hell on the Kalos Elite Four. Let's see if this monster squad has what it takes. First is Malva, the Fire-type Elite Four member. She leads Pyroar and I lead Monophobia. Pyroar goes for a Noble Roar, so the Earthquake that Monophobia retaliates with isn't enough for the kill. So on the next turn, Malva uses a Full Restore and I go for a Power-Up Punch to offset the attack drop from Noble Roar. Then Pyroar hits a Flamethrower and Monophobia knocks it out with another Earthquake. Next is Talonflame, which threatens with massive damage from Flare Blitz and Brave Bird. I go for a Protect to get some leftovers recovery. We'll be able to survive at least one Flare Blitz or Brave Bird, so it's safe to stay in here and do damage with Double Edge, which won't do recoil damage thanks to our Rock Head ability. But then the worst thing that can happen to a Nuzlocker happens to me. I misclick. So Talonflame hits me with a Brave Bird, and then Monophobia tries to hit an Earthquake which Talonflame is immune to. That's a pretty terrible start to the Elite Four. Fortunately, I am able to get a little bit of HP back with Leftovers by using Protect on the next turn. So as long as Talonflame doesn't crit me with her attack, I'll be able to live and retaliate with Double Edge. So Talonflame goes for a Flare Blitz. And we survive with nine HP. That lets us fire off a massive Double Edge. But then Talonflame's Flame Body activates, burning Monophobia. 
So even with the leftovers recovery, burn damage is just enough to kill the last surviving member of the Sinister Six. I am so sorry, Monophobia. That was a terrible mistake, and you had to pay for it. But you know what? You're with your friends now. And your mom. Rest well. Like a bat out of hell, Dracophobia comes out and splits Talonflame's eardrums apart with a boom burst. Torkoal comes out next for Malva, so I switch to Botanophobia, who tanks a critical hit Stone Edge. Torkoal's only fire-type move is Flame Wheel, so it's pretty safe to set up Leech Seed here. Then I go for Phantom Force, which stalls some turns as Leech Seed drains Torkoal of its health. On the next turn, we hit it for a little bit of damage, and then Torkoal goes for a curse. I switch back to Dracophobia on a Flame Wheel as Leech Seed brings Torkoal into the red. So Malva uses a full restore, but Boom Burst and Leech Seed damage brings it back into the red. So another Boom Burst finishes it off on the next turn. Last is Chandelure, so I click Dragon Pulse, and then Chandelure lowers our special attack with Confide. So another Dragon Pulse leaves it with a sliver as it goes for Confuse Ray. So I switch to Osmophobia, who gets hit with a Confide, I guess, and then we outspeed and kill the Chandelure with the Night Slash, which of course triggers Flame Body, because why not? But that doesn't matter. That's the first Elite Four member down. Second is the Water-type Elite Four member, Seabold. He leads Klawitzer, and I lead Osmophobia. I start with an Acid Spray to lower Klawitzer's special defense, and then he hits us with a very hard Water Pulse. Then I switch to Dracophobia, who resists Water Pulse. Dracophobia now baits Dragon Pulse from Klawitzer, meaning that I have a completely safe switch into Phasmophobia without worrying about having to get confused by Water Pulse. From here, thanks to the special defense drop from Acid Spray, I'm able to knock out the Klawitzer with a Thunderbolt. Gyarados comes out next, but it obviously goes down to a Thunderbolt. Third is Starmie, so we knock it out with a Shadow Ball. And then last is Barbarical, so I switch to Botanophobia, who tanks a Razor Shell. Then on the next turn, a Seed Bomb knocks out Barbarical, netting us a pretty easy victory. Unfortunately, I was planning on using Monophobia for the remaining two Elite Four members. Now that I can't do that, I have to resort to a slightly riskier strategy. First is Wickstrom, the less risky of the two. He leads Klefki, and I lead Globophobia. I start by setting up Calm Minds as Klefki starts doing damage with Flash Cannon. I need three Calm Minds, so as long as Klefki doesn't get a bunch of crits and special defense drops from Flash Cannon, this part shouldn't be too bad. Thankfully, I'm able to get off all three Calm Minds without any critical hits, so after that, I protect for some leftovers recovery, and then I kill the Klefki with a Shadow Ball. Probopass comes out next, and since it has Sturdy, we're never one-shotting this thing. Fortunately, this Probopass is completely special, so it just hits a fairly weak power gem. Wickstrom uses a few full restores here, which honestly just gives us leftovers recovery, and then a few turns later, Probopass goes down to a Shadow Ball. Third is Caesar, but it too goes down to a Shadow Ball. And then last is Aegislash, but even in shield form with massive defenses, it's not tanking a plus three Shadow Ball. Thankfully, it doesn't know Shadow Sneak. That's Wickstrom defeated. Last for the Elite Four is Drasna. I need to pull off another Calm Mind setup, but it is significantly riskier this time because she leads with a Dragalge that knows Thunderbolt. If it crits while I'm setting up, I'll probably lose. Or if it paralyzes me. Yikes. Okay, so now I need to dodge two turns of crits and full paras. Let's see if this somehow works out. Dragalge hits a Thunderbolt on the next turn, which doesn't crit, and then we get off some damage with Shadow Ball. Okay. Then on the next turn, Dragalge hits a Thunderbolt, which again doesn't crit, and then we avoid the full paralysis, letting me baton pass to Dracophobia. With a single Calm Mind boost and the pre-damage from Shadow Ball, Dracophobia is able to Dragon Pulse her way through Drasna's entire team. This was a wildly risky strategy, and it's not great that I got away with it unpunished, but whatever. Happy Halloween, I guess. That's Drasna and the Elite Four defeated. All that's left is the champion Diantha. And look, I actually remembered to record it this time. Sorry to those of you who are expecting another puppet show. Now, for whatever reason, they decided to make Diantha a steaming pile of hot garbage. She is by far the easiest champion, for many reasons, but one of them is that all her Pokemon only have eight IVs across the board. I have no idea why, but it makes for a pretty easy fight. She leads Halucha and I lead Dracophobia. With a wide lens equipped, Air Slash has perfect accuracy and we're able to kill Halucha in one shot. Then, second for Diantha is Aurorus, the other reason why she is a total pushover. This thing's moveset of Thunder, Blizzard, Light Screen, and Reflect means that if you can stall it out of Blizzard and Thunder PP, it is completely safe to set up with any Pokemon. So I switch to Osmophobia and tank a Blizzard. 
Then I just start using a combination of Confide and Protect to stall Aurorus out of PP and lower his special attack. The great thing about this is that Blizzard and Thunder are pretty low accuracy moves, so Aurorus tends to miss a not insignificant amount of the time. After I brought Aurorus down to minus 6 special attack and drained her of all 5 of her Blizzard PP and all 5 of her Thunder PP, I switch to Globophobia and get hit by a Thunder, which paralyzes me. Right, so Thunder has 10 PP, not 5, my bad, but whatever. Technically, it would be safer to switch back to Osmophobia and stall out Aurorus' remaining Thunder PP because I am at risk to a critical hit here, but I don't really care at this point. Like I said, Diantha is really easy and I'm not worried about being able to beat her. So I just relax and set up a few Calm Minds. I go unpunished and somehow I avoid being fully paralyzed even once. Aurorus also misses Thunder a comical amount of times. Then I use Baton Pass to pass the Calm Mind boost to Phasmophobia. I forgot that Light Screen was still up, so a Shadow Ball doesn't kill Aurorus, which does let it get off a of Thunder. I am just begging to be punished by a Paralysis or a Critical Hit here, but it doesn't happen. It's spooky season. Diantha heals, but with Light Screen wearing off, a Shadow Ball knocks out Aurorus from full health. Tyrantrum is out next, but a Dazzling Gleam knocks it out in one shot. Then it's Gorgeist, so we Shadow Ball it in the face. Fifth is Gudra, but it gets its Gleam dazzled real good and goes down in one shot as well. Last is Diantha's Gardevoir. Now I can easily outspeed this thing and kill it with a Shadow Ball, but I decide to end this battle in poetic fashion instead. So, Gardevoir Mega evolves, and then I click Destiny Bond, dooming us both as Mega Gardevoir fires off a Psychic, which... Oh right, I forgot that Calm Mine actually gave us some special defense boosts. Well, at the time, I wasn't sure if Destiny Bond could actually be used multiple times in a row in this generation, or if it would just fail like when using Protect, Turns out that in Generation 6, you can just use Destiny Bond over and over again, but at the time, I wasn't sure, and I didn't really feel like figuring it out. So I just knock out Gardevoir with a Shadow Ball, which wins us the battle, and the run. Well, there you have it. The story of how a team of spooky Pokemon defeated the Kalos League and became champions. The ending team was certainly not what I would have expected, and we faced far more hardships than I would have thought. But through teamwork, sacrifice, tricks and treats, we made it to the end. The Sinister Six may no longer be with us, but I know somewhere they're smiling down on us, proud of what we've accomplished. Thanks for listening to my Halloween story. And no matter what your plans are, I hope you all have a safe and happy Halloween with the people you love. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. And you should also join the Flygon HG community discord, where you can discuss nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link is in the description. Stay tuned for more nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.